You are listening to the podcast of New Life Church in Wayland, Michigan. Our longing is to see zero people in our community living unchanged by Jesus. We are a church navigating the messiness of life together in community. One of our core convictions is that everyone is welcome, no one is perfect, and anything is possible. I hope you know there is a place in the family for you here. For more information on gathering times and location, check out our website. But for now, I hope God speaks powerfully to you through this word. As we continue our series, Soul Work, this morning, I am really, really excited to be able to introduce our speaker to you uh, this morning. And so, this is Brad Molker. Everybody say, hi, Brad. I'm to the point where, like, we don't allow any other people other than Brad's, I guess, to speak on. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, But I am so excited for this guy to come and bring the word. He did a phenomenal job in first service. Um, He has become a good friend of mine. We had the chance to go to Guatemala together. He was on that trip. Uh, But he also serves on our advisory team as a church. And so his his wisdom I've gotten a front row seat to over this past year, which has been awesome. He's a teacher in Martin School District. And... (laughs) <laughs> and uh, is a leader in our youth group. He's actually spoken a couple different times to our students and our youth group and foster dad, husband, father. And so I just love this guy. I love his heart for this community and for young people and for Jesus. And so if you don't mind, I know we just prayed, but I would love to just pray over him as we jump into this teaching this morning. So God, thank you so much for Brad and for his whole family, Lord. We thank you for the calling that you have placed on their lives to serve and love young people, whether that's through foster care in the school system. God, you know we need good teachers in the school system. Father, we thank you for their calling in youth ministry here at New Life, and I just thank you for the way that you have already used him. And I pray that this morning that your spirit will speak powerfully through him, that as you promise, your word will not return void that our hearts will be pierced with this double-edged sword, Lord, that we will walk away looking more like you as a result of what we hear today. And so, Father, we thank you for him, and I pray you'll bless this word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, thank you all. Uh, We're going to start this out, same as last, but we're going to do this correctly. From now on, I am Brad, and that is the other Brad. All right. Uh, there's room for two of us, but we do have to establish some. I'm the, the Brad. Um, so he asked me a few weeks ago to do this sermon, and at first I wanted to run out the door. Um, but then I remembered something that uh, our leader in Guatemala told us. And he said, I wasn't, or he wasn't the one that God chose first, but he was the one that said yes. And that's something that I've tried to kind of stick by this last month since Guatemala is saying yes, taking steps, because so often we're told that we can't do something and we really can do it. Uh, The other reason is, well, he's my pastor and I heard if I tell him no, then I'm going to have a bad afterlife. So (laughs) had had to say yes. Um, But I've learned a lot from creating this, developing this sermon. He helped me a lot. The whole zero collective pastors, I had to thank them because they helped me as well. And we're going to be talking about the Christian discipline of simplicity. And the funny thing is, simplicity is not simple at all. It's actually very, very complex. Um, And it's also one of the most important disciplines that we're going to be practicing because a lot of the other ones stem off of this. Some people call simplicity the trunk, and then the rest of the disciplines are the branches because simplicity is something that's going to start inside of us, and then everything else is going to happen because of that. The hard part is simplicity has to do with a lot of things that we don't like talking about all the time, whether it's money, possessions, materials, time. Um, there's a lot of things that you know we like to kind of shy away from, but they're some of the core things that we do need to talk about as Christians and talk about as a church. Um, so developing this was a challenge because those are things that I don't always like to look at as well, and it forced me to. So we're going to jump in with a story, uh, and I brought a little prop just as a picture of it, but it is the story of the fisherman and the businessman. So, one morning, fisherman comes out, he fishes from the beach, the same beach every day. He knows the best fishing spot in the entire world. So he wakes up, beautiful sunset, or sunrise, sorry, he comes out, he's standing, you know, toes in the sand, 
First cast, bang, gets a fish. Not like me, because this I literally broke getting out of the garage. Um, <laughs> second cast, another fish. Third, and it just continues until his whole bucket is full of fish. It was a good day, but that happens to him every day because, like I said, he knows exactly where to go, and he always catches enough fish to last him for a while. So he takes his bucket of fish, and he goes to the market. He sells some of them. He buys some apples, vegetables, some chicken for dinner, whatever. Saves some to bring home. And then he gets to go sit on the pier. And the two things that he likes the most in the world are fishing and relaxing by the ocean. So he walks to the end of the pier, sits on his bench, and the whole, all the locals know it's his bench because he's there every morning because he's such a good fisherman. He gets to go there. So he's sitting, relaxing, listening to the waves, looking at the seagulls, and suddenly a car pulls up. And kind of everyone hears it because it's a nicer car. Out of the corner of his eye, he sees a man get out of the car with some slacks, some sandals, sunglasses, Hawaiian shirt buttoned half up. I was going to tease my dad, but he's unfortunately not here. But, you know, a, a typical guy from the city, a tourist, though everyone on the pier would say as they rolled their eyes. And, but this man isn't a typical businessman. He walks down the pier. He's very, very friendly. He talks with everyone. And he gets to the end, and he notices a man sitting on his bench, fishing pole propped up. And he's like, why isn't this guy fishing? Like, so he strikes up a conversation. You going fishing soon? And the fisherman replies, tells him a story. No, I know the best place in the whole world. I already caught enough for, for today and tomorrow, so I'm done. This bewilders the, the businessman a little bit. He's like, well, why would you stop? If the fishing is so good, why wouldn't you keep fishing? I mean, you could keep catching more, and you could bring more to the market. You could make some money, make extra money. And the fisherman, no, I already have enough. I, I caught enough. I have enough for the day. I have enough to last me for a while. But I, I'm pretty good. And the businessman, well, still gets more confused. Well, why wouldn't you want more? Why wouldn't you want... I mean, you like fishing, you could catch more. You could buy enough to buy a boat and a motor. Imagine all the fish you could catch if you're out on the boat. You don't, you're not stuck on the beach. I bet you could catch enough, you could make enough money to have a couple boats, and then you could start a business like I run. You could you know, buy a mansion. I have a couple houses. You could buy a cars like mine. You could buy anything you want. You'd be rich. And the fisherman asked, well, what would I do after I became rich then? And the businessman says, well, you could do anything you want. You could wake up in the morning every day and come sit here and, w and watch the water. Now, you already know that's exactly what the fisherman was doing. He was already doing exactly what he wanted. He didn't need all that extra stuff. So we're going to be looking at those two characters and some of their stuff, some of their characteristics for most of this sermon. We're going to label them the fisherman and the businessman. Now, if I pose this question of, do you believe you're more like the fisherman or the businessman. Now, at first, it's really easy. You know probably who you should, but if we break down each character, they're, they're okay characters. The fisherman was happy with his life, enjoying his life, doing what he wanted. The businessman was nothing wrong. He was, must be intelligent. He's running a business. He's rich. But he was able to talk and converse with all the people on the pier. There's nothing wrong with either of them. He was ambitious. I mean, running your business, you have to be. But I think if we break them down even farther, you can relate to one more than the other. And we're not, I do want to say, we're not going to label one as a bad guy and one as a good guy. It's just who are we going to identify with? Now, I am more like the businessman the first time I read this. I've been taught, and I teach kids, you make goals, and then what happens? You meet that goal, and you make a new goal. You meet that goal, you make another one. But where does that ever stop? Like in the business world, he said eventually you could get to doing whatever you want if you have enough money. But if we're constantly setting goals and, and smashing them, setting more, that's who I am taught to be. I'm taught to be like the businessman. But the problem is, is that Jesus often points us in the opposite direction, in the in the direction of the business or in the, in the direction of the fisherman more often than not. And in fact, he preaches about materials is one of his top talked about topics and taught. So we're going to be looking at one part of the scripture today. So if you have your uh, Bibles, you can open up to Luke 12, 
chapter 13. And we're pretty much going to stay in this one little section. Um, I'm going to refer to it, and then we'll talk about it, and then we're going to come back to it towards the end. But to set the scene, he, Jesus is teaching to thousands. They traveled. There's a huge crowd. You can imagine all the people pushing to the front, cramming through the crowd like it's a concert, trying to get closer to Jesus. And he's teaching his disciples. He's talking to them, and he gets interrupted. Now, as a teacher... I hate getting interrupted when I teach. <laughs> like, whoever taught kids that there are no stupid questions is wrong. Because if I'm teaching about solving for X and you ask me what's for lunch, that is a stupid question. But G, luckily, Jesus is a better teacher than I am. I'm pretty good, but he's way better. So someone in the crowd interrupts him. He blurts out, tell my brother to divide that inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? And then he said to them, Watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Now, I love his reaction. He literally doesn't even answer the question. The guy blurts out, interrupts him, kind of just ignores him. I'm, that's not my job. Now, I can imagine the thought in Jesus' head, like, I'm here to be your savior and you're asking me about your possessions. I don't really care. But Jesus also recognizes that there is a larger problem. If that man is interrupting, then there's something going on that is bigger. So his next two words are some of the most important words that you can see in this. It's watch out. Now, one of the things I enjoyed about creating or developing this sermon with Pastor Brad is, or the other Brad, is we, got, we read the same passage over and over, multiple days. Now, one day I would read it differently, like he's begging people, please, please watch out, and, or is it more a command? Watch out. But it's there. He's giving us an, a warning, and I think it's because the next sentence, be on guard against all kinds of greed. Now greed, he's warning you to watch out for it. So I, I actually went and looked and broke down the word greed. It's from an old English word called gradig or voracious meaning that it's always hungry, it's, all, it's insatiable, it always wants more, it can never, ever have enough. And it seems like that'd be pretty obvious. But why would Jesus have to tell us to watch out for it? And he tells us that because so often greed is actually labeled as something else. We can label greed like the businessman, did he seem greedy? He wanted more and more, but sometimes we just call that ambition. Was he ambitious or was he greedy? They're kind of the same thing, but there's a, a distinct line that we'll establish for that. But Jesus knew at either that man that was asking him or the other man on the other side of the inheritance must have had some greed in their heart because he's warning them, watch out. And then he follows it up with, uh, life does not consist with an abundance of things. So a real emphasis here is Jesus isn't saying you can't have anything. He's not saying... You need nothing. He's saying an abundance of possessions. Or in other words, life does not consist in too much. All right. So the businessman, if we're breaking that down, he wanted more and more. And the fisherman was okay with just having it enough. He didn't have an abundance of stuff, but he was content with what he had. Now, as I read this, I, did, I had to do a lot of reflecting to try to connect with the sermon. And at first, I don't consider myself greedy. But... After you break that down and we start looking at how greed is different, I am greedy. You know, I do at times want more, probably more than I need to. Whether it's why we're looking at a house or a car or whether it's with my time, I always want more time. I set goals, I continue to work. I don't know if I'm overambitious or not or if I'm just ambitious, but there are times when I know that I'm greedy. One of them is with organizing my time. I cram more and more into my schedule. But how often do I miss an opportunity from God because it didn't fit my schedule? I had my schedule too crammed, and I needed more and more time. Or like in my classroom, if I organize more and more of my books, I can fit more books inside of in, in my bookshelf. You know, that is being a little bit greedy. Trying to fit more when I don't really need more is part of the definition of greed. So maybe you can think of a place in your area that you're greed, greedy, where you want more of something. It happens in all of us. It's, it's natural. But it comes in many forms, but really all that that is is just 
an attempt to fill a void in your heart. And the problem is, you're trying to fill that with gifts of God, but without God himself. And that's where it's the, the line that we establish. Okay, when you're trying to fill your life with things from God, but without God, that's the line that we have to draw. It's okay to want, the, want more, is what we're told always. So why do we always feel that way? Why do we feel like we want, it's okay to want more, and it's not okay to be like the fishermen? It's not okay to have the minimum, and it's not okay to set a goal and stop. See, we live in America, and modern society, we are driven by consumerism. It's the leading thing that makes us decide things. And I'm a nerd, I like digging into the history. I have a history degree. And there was this man named Edward Bernays. And he was actually a soldier. He went over and fought in World War. And while he was there, he was really, really interested in the Nazis and their propaganda and all the war advertisings. And he thought, how can I take war propaganda and bring it back to America and use that on American citizens. And one of the, the craziest quotes that I found while reading a book was up here, conscious and intelligent manipulation of habits and opinions of the masses is an important element of democratic society. Those who can manipulate this constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. He was literally came back with the goal of a way to manipulate and to make us think, make us want more. And he wanted it to be invisible so we don't even notice it. And he did an excellent job. He's called the father of um, American advertising. And they are still continuing this. It's one of the reasons that what we always see more and more, why we always get pushed to being more like the businessman. And honestly, we want things that we can't even comprehend. Like, if you look at a new iPhone or a new Samsung Galaxy versus the last one, what's the difference? Is it like 0.1 size difference? I know one time I did buy one because it was like a half a megapixel better than the other one. I don't even know what a half of a megapixel does, but I bought the more expensive one and the new one. Um, and not only are we always wanted towards new things, we're pushed towards wanting more and more and more. The average house in America has 300,000 items in it. Now, I didn't count all of our stuff, but it's really easy to see if you have things that you don't need, okay? Um, one recent study stated that 30% of Americans cannot park in their garages. I laugh at that, but my car is parked in my driveway right now because I can't pull into my garage. So it's a very realistic, I'm one of those 30%. So why does it continue? Why do we continue that? I can point that out, people can point that out, studies can, but why do we continue to live that way? Well, one, advertising, like I said, they bombard us. On an average, they said that you see 5,000 ads or logos a day. They'll put commercials within a commercial and another one, and you don't even realize that you're seeing these ads all the time. But it's more than that, it's more, they took what we are already bad at and they're just manipulating it. But really it comes down to we're human. We are led by two very distinct emotions that make us think like the businessman. And one is want. And want is really easy to see. You know when you want something. I want things that I logically should not want, like the new phones and stuff that don't matter. Those are easy to kind of see. But it's really important to ask why do we want things? Why do you want it? Is it because it's useful? Maybe you need it for your job. Is it because we're comparing it with our neighbor? Why is, is a driving force behind our, should be a driving force behind our decisions? But the other emotion that sometimes we don't realize we have is fear. Now, fear is a really easy thing to manipulate because people don't realize that they're living out of fear. Um, like if you don't have that new phone or that new computer, you might lose your job. So. You're driven by fear. But the other realistic thing about fear is a lot of us have lived our lives without enough. We have the businessman who had enough. We had the businessman or the fisherman that had enough. The businessman wanted more. But we have lived in a world where we were, where we did not have enough. And that's a real problem. Maybe it's you didn't have enough money for bills. You did not have enough 
food to live healthy. You did not have enough love in your life. You did not have enough time. That's a real, real problem that we have experienced, scarcity. We've, we've lived in a world, and we live in a world where we're told we don't have enough. Now, Brene Brown said, scarcity thrives in a culture where everyone is hyper aware of lack. You can see when you lack something. I mean, 50, 100 years ago, we didn't have interactions with millionaires and billionaires all the time. Now today, you see them everywhere, TV, social media. You get to see when you don't have the same things as other people or when you, or you feel like you don't have enough. We're stuck in that mindset that we don't have enough because at one point in our life, we did not. And we don't know how to go from not having enough to being okay with having enough. We want to skip that and we want to go from I didn't have enough, now I need extra. And there's that middle ground is where we should be living. Even 2,000 years ago, Jesus knew that this was going to be a problem, though. They didn't have propaganda or advertising, but the cool thing about looking at people is even 2,000 years ago, they had the same emotions that you have. They have fear, pride, want, overambition. They have the same things. Jesus knew that we would be in a world of iPhone 25s or whatever, would, and he wanted to know, are you okay with having that iPhone 24? So Jesus wouldn't just simply ask, are you more like the fisherman or the businessman? He would pose the question a little bit differently. In a world pushing you towards faster, newer, larger, are you okay with having enough? Or the way that we like to ask it today is, in a world telling you to want more, are you okay with having enough? And I think if we, I honestly talk, answer that, there are times where I say, no, I'm not okay with having enough, I want more. And, and it can be a problem. Jesus was calling his di disciples, and he was calling the crowd and us into what we identified earlier as simplicity. But what exactly does it mean to have a simple, simplicit life? It doesn't mean that it's easy. Earlier I said that it's an inward reality. So simplicity is a lifestyle. It's something that changes inside of you and it impacts all of your decisions, your thoughts coming outward. So simplicity is knowing and being committed to loving our neighbors as ourselves. Simplicity is having our sole purpose of building a relationship with God and helping others to do the same. And that starts inside. It, simplicity is not a checklist. It's not just a rule. That would just be a cover-up. Those don't deal with any root problems. Uh, Jesus didn't give us guidelines and say, you can only have this much money in your bank account. You can only have this many items in your house. That's not what he was after. He's not after you following a list of rules. He's interested in building that relationship and changing you from the inside out. Um, when you live with simplicity, you're not depriving yourself of things that you need. Simplicity is Jesus growing with you and teaching you to be content with what you do have. It's free from the trap of our modern society, and it's going towards seeking his kingdom first and nothing else. Now, it's going to look different. Simplicity, because it's not a set of rules, it's going to look different for all of you, every one of you sitting next to each other. Simplicity is going to look different depending on your family, your job, who you are, where you're at in your Christian faith. It's just going to be different for where you're at, for what stage of life you're at. But as we talk about some of these and we focus more on materials, um, a couple weeks ago was Wayland Trash Day. Now, I love Wayland Trash Day because we get to purge, but you also see all the trucks driving around trying to pick through other people's trash. So people throw away some pretty good things. Now, I bagged on my wife earlier, but she's here now, so I can't. Sorry. But she did something. Um, while we purge every year, she included our kids in the purge this time. Now. <laughs> Not throwing away our kids, sorry. <laughs> Didn't mean that. But normally I just throw away their toys, and then two years later when they ask, I blame it on her and say, Mom threw, it, threw that away, I don't know where it went. But she had them gather all their stuffed animals. Now, we have three kids, and somehow we have probably 300 stuffed animals. I don't know how you get so many. But she told them all that they could pick five, which means that we were throwing away like 200 stuffed animals. Not throwing away, but... And we expected waterworks, like fire hydrant style, because our kids cry so much that they get snot and you can't hear them and you can't understand them. 
That's what we were expecting. And it did not happen. They went through. They picked the five that were the most important. They picked ones that they got when they were born. They picked ones from grandparents. They picked one, the most important ones. And they were OK with letting the other ones go. We talked with them about how we have to love others. And one of the ways that we can do that is by letting these go to people that other people that need it. And they were OK with that. Because if you're holding on to something that kind of does not let anybody else enjoy it, and if you're not enjoying it and those stuffed animals are just sitting there, they were pointless. Now, somehow, I felt proud. Obviously, my kids were OK with that. We were good with the conversation. But you also felt a little bit of, of shame, because I haven't been doing that with my life for them. I mean, we have a junk drawer with, I don't know, how many of you can know everything in your junk drawer? I don't, it's junk. All right, or how about the box of cords that some of us have? I like to say, do you have one of those yellow Nextel phones that beeped? Because I probably have a charger for you if you need it. <laughs> so my kids were able to purge things that they did not need, but am I able to do the same? Am I leading my kids the same way that, or am I leading by example, or am I just having them do something that I'm not willing to do myself? So it's something to stop and reflect on. So as we talk about you know, those materials and things, we're going to go back to Luke 12, because Jesus doesn't stop just telling us to not be greedy. He actually brings us one step farther with a parable. So the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundance of harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place on, to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus of grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And it goes on. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be for with whomever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. So I've heard this parable many times. And I always laugh when God calls him a fool. Like, ah, that has to feel pretty bad if, if God is calling you a fool to your face. Um, but as I researched, I wanted to see why exactly would God call him a fool. And I ran across a sermon from Martin Luther King Jr. called Why Jesus Called the Man a Fool. And he points out some simple things that are evident in here. One, the man was very, very self-centered. I think in the one version of the, the Bible, he used the word I or my 12 times out of 60 words. He was solely centered on what was his crops. It was all about his barns. Like, did he control everything? He had no dependence on God. Everything was about him. Did he control the weather? Did he control the soil? No, but he acted like everything was his and his alone. And just like that, he had no conception of anybody else either. Like, he didn't talk about anybody helping him build the barns, anybody that helped him plow the fields. He wasn't concerned about anything other than him and his wealth and his treasure. Now, that's obviously why God called him the fool. And I'd hope God would not call me the fool, but at least I can recognize that sometimes I am a fool who is trying not to be. And there's one last thing that stands out in that verse that also establishes a line for simplicity, and that's the last line, 20. Verse 21, he says, This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. So if we read that quickly, you actually just read it as whoever stores things up for, whoever stores things up is not rich towards God. But when he says, does not store up things for themselves, is a really important thing to establish with the simplicity. Because it's not a numbers game. Remember when I said it's not a rule. It's not you can only have this many things. It's also how are you using your things? Like the man with the grain would probably not have been called a fool if he was talking about sharing the grain with the poor children that needed it. What is a problem is how we are using our stuff. So I know people in here that have everything you can think of in terms of tools and fun things and everything that you could need, but everything that you could want, too. And they are some of the best Christian people I know. They genuinely love others. They accumulate stuff 
and then it goes right back to people that they're serving. They're not wanting more for themselves. They're wanting more so that they can support more people. I know people that have live in five-bedroom houses and then add on to the house even more. And they added on to the house so that they had an extra room for another foster kid that they wanted to. So it's not just a checklist of you can only have so much stuff. It's how are you using your stuff? Why are you accumulating it? And what are, what are you doing with it? So how is it possible to stop living like the businessman, stop living like the fool, and start living more like the fisherman? Stop living like you need more and more, and stop, start living with being content. This question has been pretty difficult right now. I already mentioned just a couple of my shortcomings, but I like how I struggle with my schedule or keeping junk that I don't need. But my wife and I are also house shopping right now. Um, I'm probably getting a new job as a principal, so we are looking for more. And that's the key word, we keep looking for more. See, when we bought the house that we're at right now, right down the road, we got lucky. It was right when the market started taking off. Um, my mom knew the people selling, so we got to go in. We still got, had to pay over asking price, but we were lucky. But when we moved in, the whole time we were thinking, this house is enough, but it's not what we want. And that's a terrible mindset. It's enough, but it's not what we want. Now, that house has been a blessing. I ended up working right at the middle school, and we live right by the, the park. So I was able to work, wake up two minutes before school, still make it on time. We live right by the park. We have three young kids. We get to go to the park. We live right there. The church is right here. We probably would not be connected as much or involved as much with the church if we weren't right there. That house has been a blessing. It's been enough. And at the time, we probably would have picked any other house other than that because it wasn't on our checklist of more and more and more. And now my fear is that we're going to do the same thing. So writing this has really helped me be conscious of it's OK to have enough. We don't always have to look for more and look for the next best thing. But still, how do you do that? We already established that we're bombarded with modern, from our modern society. We're bombarded with advertising, with social media. So how can you live more like the fisherman in a world telling you to be like the businessman? So I came up with three just guidelines that are very general, but I wanted them to be practical, and they're things that you can do throughout your life. So one, carefully set your priorities. Now, life is not about balance. Whoever told you that you gotta balance everything, life is not about balance. Life's about having priorities and giving your time and assets to those priorities. Your faith should be your highest. And if I have one down here as a hobby, I don't need to try to balance those. That's not what life is about. So continue to set priorities and follow through on them, whether it's with your faith, whether it's with your possessions, whether it's with everything. Set your priorities and maintain them. Continue to ask. Why am I doing this, or why do I want this? Does it go with my priority, or is it because of some external force? Two, detach from negatives and attach with positives. And that can be a struggle. We have things in our face all the time. Sometimes we need to take a step back and detach from them, whether it's from your social media, from friends that are a, a hindrance to your relationship with God. Sometimes you just need to get away from negative and attach yourself with those priorities that you set. Attach yourself with more time in prayer and building a relationship with God. Three, serve others. Now, this is a calling as Christians, but us as a church especially here in Wayland. If you are not living a life of simplicity, you're not able to serve others to the best that you can. You're holding on to things that could be useful to others, holding on to your time when it could be used to help others. If you are not living simplistic, you're not able to serve those at the best that you can. So what areas in your life might need some simplifying? Maybe it's one of them that I talked about, your time, your organization. Maybe it's your materials. How are you using them? Maybe you need to step away from some things like detachment to simplify. But I wanted to give you one more verse before we wrap up. 
Do not lay yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust and where thieves do not break and steal. For where your treasure is, is where your heart will be also. The world is never going to stop you to not, never going to stop telling you to want more. It's never going to tell you it's okay to be enough. It's okay to be the fisherman. It's always going to push you to be like the businessman. But your possessions, your money, everything that you have, your schedule, your organization skills, your treasures here on earth are nothing. They're just going to continue to try to fill your life with something that should be being filled with God. And you know what? It's never going to work. You're never going to accumulate enough stuff to feel truly fulfilled because as soon as you get that, you're going to be looking for the next thing. But Jesus is inviting you to give your priorities, your time, your possessions, and your treasures to him. Jesus is inviting you to live with the realization that he is the only thing that will ever be enough. He is the thing that can fulfill you and fill that void. And that is living simplistic, living with the sole purpose of building your relationship with Jesus. And I challenge you to ask some of those questions today. I challenge you to be okay with having enough. Maybe start out small. It's okay with having enough of one thing. It's going to be a process. But I challenge you that. Be okay with having enough at some point, at, in some places in your life. Uh, let's wrap in prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for the chance to be up here and talking. Just please help us to be okay with having enough and having enough with you. Um, continue to help us fill our lives, not with treasures of this world, but with you and our relationship with you. We love you. Thank you for everything that you give us. Thank you for everything that you do for us. Amen.